I'm really honored to be invited by EFI Theological Commission to be part of this webinar. And uh, this unique opportunity, I think, will bring evangelical thinking together at this most crucial time. Uh, we had three remarkable sessions. Dr. Vinay, Dr. Ken, and Dr. Taka has stimulated our thinking in a wonderful way. And I'm really thankful to God for their special contribution. Today, we would like to explore the biblical resources in relation to the uh, pandemic. I would like to share the screen uh, with that. Uh... You can share your screen now. Yes. Exploring biblical resources in approaching pandemic, uh, diseases, disasters, and afflictions, God and his people's response. That's why I would like to put the title for this webinar. Uh, we approach this subject with a few questions. Are all national calamities that, are, uh, that Israel experienced a judgment of God for the sinfulness? Is there a calamity that was natural and not due to sin of the people? How God enables his people in the Bible to understand and respond to diseases, pandemic and disasters. What theological reflections from the past are helpful to church's response to the present COVID uh, crisis? Mm -hmm. Um, before going into the details, I would like to look at some remarks. I want to make some remarks. Number one, that we cannot do a very focused study, but rather I can give you an overview of biblical teaching that can guide us in our further reflection. The second aspect we need to keep in mind is there is complexity of the language, particularly pandemic, epidemic, or endemic, are modern terms and we will not find these terminologies in the Bible. Rather, you will find plague, pestilence, disease, afflictions or suffering. And maybe we can call suffering a new name that is COVID-19. Then there are contextual challenges that we have. The question of is Corona a God or is it from God? Because already there is worship going on for Corona Devi and Corona Ma, Corona Mai. And this is the context in which we are living. But at the same time, we need to realize that in the majority culture, afflictions are not directly linked with God, but part of the innate picture of our samsara cycle of rebirth. I think um, Dr. Uh, Vinay has dealt with this aspect in the first seminar. The other thing that we need to remember is that we also have an idea that disease and disasters are part of Bhagwan Ki Leela or play of gods or an angry spirit or demons. You know, this aspect is very much um, we are also familiar with within the church. Um, we don't know, I haven't yet heard, uh, you know, considering coronavirus as demonic attack. Um, but the other aspect we also need to keep in mind is the taxonomy which means that we look at the problem with doctrinal hierarchy, a tendency to elevate a particular doctrine or a thinking while approaching uh, the problem. For example, eschatology is a, is a major thing that has emerged during this crisis, end time theology, COVID as a sign of the end of the history, or uh, so heavenly oriented Christians, heaven is my home, soon I'll be there or God as an eschatological judge who is punishing the world, or an eschatol uh, ecclesiology which overemphasizes a spirituality and a withdrawal from the world and from the afflicted com communities around us. So with the uh, Zoom calls, we are almost like boxed gatherings. Our engagement with the society is very limited. So there is a, a, an eschatology that is emerging. 
Now let's look into the, uh, the main theme of, the, of today's discussion. Uh, first, I would like to look at the vocabulary that is available in the scripture. Um, there are various words that have been used, particularly uh, plague. You know, the question is, is COVID a, can be qualified as a biblical plague? Not really, but exactly, but we can say that there are similarities to biblical plagues. There are different terms that are used in the Old Testament. Dabar is a, is a word for plague, and we see that in Hosea 13, Exodus 9, these terms are used, this term is used. Makha is another word which connotes a natural cause for the pestilence, that is in Amos chapter 4 verse 10. Nega is another word which refers to a direct strike from God. We see that in Exodus 11. Uh, the New Testament also followed a similar manner. Uh, loimos is a, is a word that's used. Plege is, the, is another word that's been used, which very much similar to the Old Testament concept. I would like to draw some of the examples from the scripture uh, regarding the afflictions. And there are individuals who are afflicted. I don't know whether you remember, Elisha was, uh, fell sick uh, with a terminal illness, not because of his sin. A powerful person was used by God to heal the Shunammite son, as well as heal the Naman of his leprosy, but he is uh, under terminal illness. Job's experience is another thing that we all know, righteous may severely suffer. Jesus in Luke chapter 13, verses three, four to five, you know, we see that the calamities are not necessarily a gauge of one's spirituality or a judgment or, or a punishment for the sin. But there are other uh, passages which, which directly deals with uh, plagues as a judgment from God, particularly the story of Egyptian. Um, the Yahweh strikes Egypt with various diseases. The Philistines are affected because Yahweh afflicted them. The same thing with the nation of Israel, pestilence. You know, one of the uh, dreadful judgment that comes upon Israel along with war, famine, wild beast, and pestilence is one of those. And then God promised judgment if people of Israel turned against the law. And part of this judgment includes plagues. So if you can go through the scripture in these lines and we find uh, so much of uh, examples about plagues and afflictions. That is on, on a general level, I'm not thoroughly covered particular verses. But then there are some important questions to ask. The who, who question? You know, who's the, what's the source and who is the source of, the, of these afflictions? And the, one of the major themes within the scripture is that God as a source to both wound as well as to the he healing, healing process. Motive uh, very clearly that that ultimate authority to wound and to heal is, is com it, it comes from Yahweh. But at the same time, scripture do not always connect sickness to specific personal or corporate sin. I mentioned the example of uh, Elisha. And at the same time, prophetic anticipation of a day when Yahweh will gather his scattered, afflicted people to bind up their wounds and heal them. There is a move from God to restore people. Then why? What are his intentions? And the number one that we need to see it as afflictions, disasters, are part of a pedagogical device. That means it helps people to learn about God. And this is very clearly seen in the New Testament, James chapter 5, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. You know, it talks about the details in which of the restoration and the learning experience that are attached to those passages. The story of Zechariah in Luke chapter 1 we see that particular aspect. Uh, also punishment, particularly, we see that uh, in, a, in, a, in a large number in the Old Testament, examples of David's census taking and the punishment that has come, Ananias and Sapphira, you know, he, Herod and Elymas, the magician, um, that aspect is very clear there. 
then for the spread of the gospel and even in Galatians chapter 4 13 the weakness of the flesh many interpreters would consider it as either as an infirmity or an affliction that Paul had malaria epilepsy or even eye disease and he feared that the Galatians could reject but God used it to spread the, spread it for the gospel so that element of spreading uh, uh, God uses it to spread the gospel and Paul clearly says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, um, it's for the sanctification, there's a stone in the flesh. And all these things we are familiar with. We are also um, instructed by the scripture, particularly the New Testament, that demons can also be source of affliction. These uh, references are primarily in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark and Luke, John and James don't connect demons in terms of affliction and uh, we see those references there Paul also used one time in terms of that but then there is the other uh, large number of uh, passages which talks about uh, uh, afflictions are part of the nat natural cause uh, which is mentioned again John chapter 9 is a, is a very good example James chapter 5 also uh, points to this and Luke chapter 13 where Jesus makes clear that calamities are not necessarily uh, to gauge one's spirituality. You know we also see that in Paul's letters his co-workers were also ill, diseased, disasters have happened to them and there is nothing that shows that this is because of their sin. But then let me take you to a little more deeper understanding of things, uh, particularly why? Why afflictions? And the common answer and the general answer we see uh, that is the result of sin. There was no or there were no harmful virus in the Garden of Eden. Everything was good in Genesis chapter 1 verse 31. But death and disease uh, have made marked after the sin entered into the world, particularly when Adam and Eve was being asked to move out of the garden to the eastern side of the Eden. And Paul affirms in Romans chapter 5 verses 12 to 21 uh, this factor. And we see the continuity of the same in other passages in Deuteronomy and in 2 Kings chapter 17 and in other passages in, in New Testament, in Matthew, as well as in Revelation. Then there is also afflictions can come as a result of other, others' um, oppression, uh, definitely Abel's death uh, due to Cain, Cain's uh, involvement. Uh, maybe we can bring in the, con the, the conspiracy theory part, whether if you take it seriously, whether China has a special interest in this virus. But then um, this aspect is also uh, seen in the scripture, particularly in Jeremiah chapter 21, uh, at the time of Babylonian siege, um, there was an outbreak of pestilence in Jerusalem. Then other interesting thing, which I you know, noted uh, recently, it can be part of the originally, original created order, it is, a little uh, interesting factor. Um, we may have to uh, look at it in a in a in a way that is uh, that won't that won't affect our own personal theology in that sense. In the sense that <clears throat> um, suffering was part of created order. Recently, Douglas not recently Douglas John Hall had uh, brought out a, a, a four forms of suffering that existed in the world since the creation and uh, this is before prior to the sin uh, entered to the world for example loneliness is considered as one uh, genesis 2 18 and limitations by, represented by the three of no, three of knowledge uh, of good and evil temptation the serpent helps uh, us to understand good and right anxiety which eve had uh, so that is an aspect we may have to look at. We may can discuss on these matters. 
And as a result, you know, our finite experiences, limitations can lead to frustration, hurts, and death. Diversity can bring conflicts. Limitation can cause anxiety and uh, desire. So this is one thing which we need to look at. But I don't have much except for the creation story for that. <clears throat> but Bible also talks about uh, afflictions, uh, disaster as part of, as a as mystery, particularly from the story of uh, Job. Um, it is very interesting that to note that Job experienced righteous suffering, <clears throat> although he has not sinned. And God's response in chapter 38 and 41 he doesn't blame the Satan or give a reason for Job for his suffering. His question remains unanswered. In contrast, God actually talks about the mysteries and complexities of the creation, which is beyond human comprehension. Now, I would like to take you to <clears throat> two more aspects. After that, I will conclude. God's response to affliction. Um, one of the dangers that we can face during a crisis like this is a theological iconoclasm, which means that the uh, COVID-19 has disrupted many of our theological assumptions, particularly theology of blessings, and at the same time to consider God as a healer. And this has been a big challenge to many of our rural um, congregation. And uh, there are similar uh, aspects which have been challenged because of this crisis. But at the same time, um, God's response in general uh, throughout the scripture that God initiate a redeeming uh, work in the created order, the redeeming work for Noah and his family during the flood, uh, his election of Abraham and his liberation of Israelites from the slavery of Egypt. But the most significant response that is found in Jesus Christ, particularly his passion and death on the cross, God's intervention in the creation order and to participate in human suffering as well as to save human beings and the whole created order. That's the general uh, God's response. But for me, I would like to pick up a little more uh, specific responses that have been seen uh, or reflected in the, in, the, in the history of the church. Um, recently, N.T. Wright has brought out his uh, God and the pandemic. Um, a wonderful reflection um, for the season where he says that God, Jesus redefines God's providence and atonement, kingdom of God, and he reshapes the picture of suffering, not as a spectator, but an active participant, which means that as believers, God lovers, we are shaped according to the pattern of the sun, need to be actively engaging into uh, the present situation, and at the same time, the element of lament which will allow us to wait and wait on the Lord to intervene into the situation. But what helps me is to look at, at two theological um, aspects um, and which I want to call it as the theology of cross, which comes from, uh, from Martin Luther's theology of cross at the same time, um, Moltmann's uh, The Crucified God. Um, the, Key to um, uh, my thought is the understanding of theology of presence. One of the danger that we can enter into is the emphasis on theology of presence within the four walls of the church at the time of worship, at the time of a miraculous encounter, um, those element in which we limit the theology of presence. But I think we need to take the theology of presence in a much more serious way, uh, which will um, help us to have a better, clearer reflection during the, for this season. 
I just want to summarize um, Martin Luther's view. I'm, I'm not, I'm just bringing a, a, a summary of uh, what I understood to be important. Um, for Martin Luther, theology of cause is a theology of God's self-revelation. Revelation is nonetheless is indirect and hidden in the suffering and the cross of Christ. Like Moses, Exodus 3, 33, verse 23, where God hides him and he was allowed to see things. Um, two things which we are all familiar, the dialectic between God's alien work and God's proper work. God's alien work refers to putting down, killing, taking away hope and leading to desperation and God's proper work for giving, giving mercy and creating and saving. Both comes out of the love and takes place concurrently within them. At the cross, Jesus suffered on our behalf and took upon himself our sin in order that we may possess his righteousness and that is by faith alone. Now, so that, is, that aspect is, is an important thing, which again further developed in, uh, in Moltmann's uh, work, um, Crucified God. God reveals himself to humankind through suffering and the cross, not through the power and glory. Again, the theology of presence is very important here, the cry of abandonment. Christ died on the cross crying, my God, my God. This is the beginning of true Christian theology. I think we need to take some of these past theological formulations as very important as we face this crisis. On the cross, God just not acted externally, but acted in himself. Thus crucified Christ reveals the crucified God and the suffering of Christ manifests the suffering of God himself. The son suffers dying in forsakenness, but father suffers the death of the son. And if God considered himself as the son of Jesus Christ, as the father of Jesus Christ, then he also suffers the death of his fatherhood in the death of the son. What a powerful theological statement which summarizes in this way, there is no suffering that is not God's suffering. There is no death that has not been God's death on the cross. No life and joy which has not been integrated into the eternal life and eternal joy of God. So this beautiful concept, I think we need to reflect further and take it. And some of the Asian theologians have picked up um, in, in this life, the theology of pain, uh, which we all know. I also want to look at how the early church responded. Um, and uh, there a particular theology, theology of patience is very important here. Why I picked the early church is that as we know that the scripture, we canonized maybe between 200 um, AD and 400 AD. Um, it is at that point, the reflections of the post apostolic uh, church, which responded to two major epidemic crisis. One is the plague of Galen um, um, in 1965 and the plague of 250. Um, these are very important uh, for us to understand. We also should know that the pagan response to the plague at that time, uh, which are very familiar to some of the situations here, a, if there is a plague in a city, there will be an advice sought by the leaders and a delegation being sent to some sacred locations where the priest, visitors arrive, priest, sacrifice, prophet at the sacred space, hear the word, and a poet would write it down as a poetry and give it to the delegates and they pay fees and go back, you know. Um, examples of these are found in the writings. Um, from that time, um, the city of, uh, in, a, uh, in, in Lydia, as well as in Pergamum, when they came for uh, such, uh, uh, when, they were, when they sought advices, they were given specific acts of purification for their city. But we don't know what happened uh, to that, uh, those uh, advices. But what is more interesting is to look at a, a particular uh, event or story from the life of 
Cyprian, the Bishop of Carthage. Uh, his biographer, Pontius, Pontius, was a deacon who writes about in detail uh, what has happened. So there is a double crisis, something similar to India, where persecution is on the, as a minority, there are so much persecution, but at the same time, plague broke out, vomiting, diarrhea, fever, rotting in body, and it killed many people. People fled, leaving the city. But Cyprian, a disciple of Tertullian, um, writes to help believers to think Christianly about their lives and to be different from their neighbors. And he said that you need to listen collectively to the word and which is already present in the midst and at the same time respond to the plague in a way marked by courage and patience. One interesting factor that we come to know from the early church, particularly at this period, is that there are no writings about mission strategies or how to conduct evangelism or methodology to bring people in, but there are writings which talks about patience. You know, for example, Tertullian wrote about patience on patience in 204 AD, Cyprian followed him uh, on the good of patience, 256 AD, Augustine again in 417 uh, AD. Why this is so significant for the church? I think this is a very important question that we need to ask even during this time. During that time, patients, particularly in the Greek or Roman society, in the upper society, it's an attitude, it's a noble uh, attitude of a noble soul who chooses to endure difficulties, resisting inevitability, inevit inevitabilities as she pursues a honorable cause. Um, it is nothing to do with uh, being a hero, but it's it's an attitude of a subordinate or a victim, the powerless, the poverty stricken, and often the, the, the females. What Tertullian did was to work on patience from a biblical perspective. And he said that Christian patience has nothing to do with social location, whether it is rich or poor, but it is the highest virtue. And he says that patience is the heart of being a Christian. And I was just looking into some of his writings that are about eight characters, aspects he is highlighting. Patience is rooted in, uh, in God's character. Um, um, the heart of patience is revealed in the incarnation of Jesus. Patience is not in human control. So do not try to manipulate outcomes. You live in uh, incautiously or risky. Patience is not in hurry. Patient Christians live at the pace given by God, accepting incompleteness and waiting. Patience is unconventional. It reconfigures behaviors according to Jesus' teaching in many areas of wealth, sex, and power. Patience is not violent. It accepts injury without retaliating in kind because violence is not God's calling to them and cannot bring fundamental change. Patience gives religious freedom and patience is hopeful. It entrusts the future confidently to God. And it's so interesting, the, the theological, the Christological line of thinking he, he um, compares it with. You know, basically, he draws these ideas from Tertullian and then develops it. And Tertullian and we, you know, are combining both Tertullian and uh, Cyprian in this area. Where Jesus versus Hercules, where Hercules, powerful figure, war, strength, but Jesus hated anyone stable who declined to call for a massive angelic intervention, who rejected the avenging sword who healed the servant of his enemy and Jesus went to the cross, he was scorned, spat upon. Again, uh, the fall is re, 
uh, written in terms of patience, fall of Adam and E was marked by human impatience. Subsequently, humans committed repeated acts of impatience, which backed up by demand for eye for an eye. The absence of patience is characteristic of a world in which there is no, not yet faith. When Jesus came, he, the Lord, the teacher of patience, changed things by uniting grace and faith uh, with patience. So what Cyprian was trying to do is to encourage the believers, the church, as a bishop uh, of that time. And uh, their lives are marked by habitus. Habitus is a sociological term, which you know, basically talks about reflexive bodily behavior, which now in this context as patients, that means Christians were, uh, their behavior, their reflexive, Access where displayed patience, trusting in God without able to control the outcome, living unhurriedly, living unconventionally, and loving their enemies. And Sermon on the Mount was very uh, significant for Supreme and uh, imitating God as his uh, major thing. And uh, I know that many of you are familiar with Rodney Stark's. The rise of Christianity. In his chapter on epidemics, networks, conversation, he affirmed this aspect of that period and conversion. People came to Christianity because of their reflexive habitus, uh, because uh, they were involved in elementary nursing for the plague victims, offered consolation um, because of their faith in the resurrection of Jesus. And there was unimaginable joy and demonstrated love for God by loving others. And also they maintained a bond between one another. Networking is an important thing. And Stark also uh, says that Christian response to the plague marked increase in the number of Christianity, Christians in the, in the, in the, in the, in the next uh, in the following years and centuries. I um, want to stop here. I think I've uh, shared a lot and I believe that uh, this will help us to have a meaningful conversation. Um, so I'm just uh, leaving these things. Um, Dr. Vinay, please uh, help us lead. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Finney. Theology of patience. Thank you so much for, for highlighting that. Over to uh, Dr. Vinay Samuel for his comments on the presentation. Thank you once again, Dr. Finney. Truly grateful. Finney, that was a, a brilliant uh, overview and presentation. I'm very grateful. It was not only covered a wide ground, but actually your presentation was extremely clear and precise, which means that even specialists who are, not, uh, who are basically capable, clever people, but are not specialists, can follow what you're saying, not just on the surface, but at depth. And I think that was very good indeed. I mean, so I think because I think we should have a lot more discussion than my talking. I, I, I think what I'd like to highlight fundamentally is the, the God's response to affliction in that you said, you, you, you landed finally on your theology of presence that fundamentally uh, God's presence and the participation in all our lives, including our suffering, including our death, including everything else. So the very presence of God, what you're saying is in the pandemic and in particularly in the suffering, there is this God's, uh, there is the, the biblical understanding is God is present. So the theology of presence we must recover and we must, uh, uh, we must not only recover, we must witness to it, we must experience it ourselves, we must demonstrate it in our lives. That's absolutely first class. Uh, secondly, you have, I think, very understandably drawn out very brilliantly the theology of patience and the, the, the whole aspect that in the way the, I mean, uh, you did a, quite a lot of uh, uh, illustrations from the early church uh, there, there was also 
not only patience, but the, the early church, because of suffering, because of pers persecution can lead to not despair, but patience. I think that was one of the aspects of uh, persecution of the early church, was because there was hope and they were really able to be patient. So I don't think in the early church's theology, we have drawn out patience in the way that you have. And I think that's absolutely right. The early Christians did do that. And I'm glad you turned to Cyprian, Tertullian, and everyone else and drew this out. And I think we need that as a very important resource for today. The way in which the early church practiced experience and witness to patience. And, and their engagement with poverty and with the, all the sickness and illness and all the troubles that the pandemics bring came out of their patience because their patience was deeply rooted, as you said, uniting grace, faith with patience because their patience came out of their faith and the experience of God's grace in their own lives. That, I think, in summary, to me, that was what you said. And I think that's absolutely right. Excellent indeed. And I think what we, I am very uh, uh, concerned indeed, because I think in this, this day and age, I think the church is being called to witness to what does, we, we know that pain and suffering are very, very real. What does it mean for the church, not to just to witness to God's blessings, but how does it respond to pain? That's really the challenge for the Christian church with us today. So how do different religions respond to pain and suffering? The sheer pain of things. Uh, my good friend and colleague, Dr. Patrick Sukhdev, uh, recently published in the British Pain Society, the role of religion. You know, it's a journal of the British Pain Society. It's a secular journal uh, by, uh, by doctors and medical professionals who deal with pain and suffering. Uh, the, uh, the, the role of different religions. I mean, how does religion become a resource? And he was very careful in the way he was able to uh, work on different, uh, you know, the different ways in which Islam, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, all of them respond to uh, pain and suffering, especially particularly pain, very much. And don't forget uh, the whole idea of uh, Buddhism is deeply, uh, deeply based on the, uh, the whole kind of dukkha, pain and suffering. And so what is the Christian witness to pain and suffering? I think you have really helped start us on that journey in a very, very important, interesting way. And I hope that we will now start looking at ways in which this becomes an opportunity for us to be able to show both the presence of God, the theology of presence, and the patience that is truly a gift to the spirit. As, a, I mean, as someone who I thought was far more Pentecostal than I am, uh, Finney, I thought you would link patience uh, a lot with the gift of the Spirit, but you didn't, which I'm a little surprised at, but that I'm delighted that to link it and say, okay, patience is a gift to the Spirit. Is that something, therefore, we, we need to witness? Let me leave it there and let uh, Vijesh now lead us in our discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Samuel. Thank you so much. Uh, what, uh, what you shared, you know, what uh, uh, truly got me was that uh, God, he did not just act externally, you know, he acted, he acted in himself. And uh, one of the slides in your PowerPoint presentation, they said, uh, you know, all suffering uh, is God's suffering. There is no suffering that is not God's suffering. There has been no death that has been uh, not been God's death on the cross and no joy that has not been integrated into the eternal life and the eternal joy of God. So I think a suffering savior definitely is some, uh, something that gives us hope, a God who suffered, uh, a God who knows our afflictions up close and personal. Now uh, it's uh, time for question and answers. Uh, if, if the participants have a question, uh, Please raise your hands. So far, I have not received any uh, Q&A on the Q&A section. There is a Q&A section on the bottom of your screen. You can uh, use that to ask your question via text, or you can raise your hand, and I can open your mic, and you can ask your question yourself. There are people who raise their hands, actually. OK, so I have uh, one person who's raised his hand, Shilas Gavit. I'm opening your mic, sir. Please ask your question. Uh, and oh, they, 
they kept put their hands back so let me let me open his mic again anyways uh, brother gavit you had a question gopal dimar maybe not maybe not let me step in something to share okay um when i emphasized on the theology of trust is we in the context in the culture we have this particularly in the northern part of india this manifestation or chamatkar will lead to pranam kind of uh, concept in the sense that you see a magical powerful glorious entry then naturally the process of conversion or people coming to the lord happens kind of mindset that we have in our mission fields and uh, although you know uh, i don't undermine you know, miracles and the powerful ways in which god does his work but i also want to emphasize the theological presence of suffering in terms of how we um, as christians um, go through this pain at the same time witnessing in which will draw people to christ so i just want to make that particular aspect of balancing both theology of presence is not just chamatkar but rather theology of presence also involves pain that's that's very important because in our seeking for the chamatkar uh, you know at times uh, it worries me in the christian circles that all we are seeking for is the miracle and the pastor would often open the service saying you will have your miracle today <laughs> you know especially on those tv channels and and you completely <laughs> ignore the reality of pain uh, and and you make pain seems at, as if it is unreal so thank you for saying that thank you for saying that uh dr laji paul i had him in mind uh he says dr finney could you explain some more uh on the inherent evil he says not sure if it's the, if that's the right word in the creation so the inherent evil in the creation even though god said that all that he had created was good genesis 1:31 and we look at creation as god's original design shall i yeah. repeat the question yeah well you know i think we should all think about it together um to go into the inherent evil i was trying to say in term the the aspect of suffering could be part of um, the creation order itself so which means that um, uh, particularly with uh, david douglas halls reference to that uh, aspect which how do we take that is that part of the creation order um so uh, you know i have not explored that much but again uh, that's the possibility that we can look at it and dr laji if you have some suggestions on this uh any thoughts on that line i i i'll just open his mic uh, sure. uh, dr laji paul i'm just opening his mic because i'd like him to pray after we, uh, uh, when we are about to end so dr laji okay is uh yes let's uh if if no yeah. one's ready i let uh, wasting time can i just respond because i did cover this in my own presentation you did uh, sir say, you know i think one of the areas that actually uh, uh, uh finning you uh, developed started developing was the whole area of theology of creation as well and what we are really talking about not inherent evil in creation but the inherent good of creation has the potential for it to turning against itself it's really like a uh, like a uh, like the immune system which is can turn against your body immune system is to protect your body it can also turn against your body 
So in a sense, in creation, we have these, God created in a way that due to certain factors, something that is good can itself turn against and become uh, destructive. And I think that's really part of what God's creation is. And I think uh, we are looking at it. And I think that's what the, the biblical understanding creation has always been, uh, that uh, the, the potential for that. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is important for us, and I'm glad that you did raise that issue. It needs to be developed much more. And I try to do that uh, in some other papers where we talk about Jesus as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. That means even before creation, before entering into creation, he suffered. So that yes. sense, yes, God's understanding that it's a suffering God is, is very much a par part of God's being to be a suffering God. So that's very Asian. That is very uh, theologically uh, way we have understood it. But it's also very biblical that if, if, he, if Jesus, who is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world, had the marks of suffering before the foundation of the world, carries it and he takes it into heaven. So it's even in heaven that suffering is still there because he's still described as the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. So in a sense, suffering or the marks of suffering are part of this created order, but a suffering that has experienced not left to itself and therefore continues to be full of pain, but that which has experienced the very grace and presence of God, the very uh, wonderful uh, change of God, I think, and, and therefore your theology of presence, uh, as well as the theology of patience come into play, that it is really that this wonderful God, it's not suffering as suffering and pain only, but suffering combined with grace, how does suffering feel? How does pain feel when grace is accompanying it? Is it still the same pain or something else? Because it, can it be taken into heaven as Jesus took his suffering into heaven? I mean, these are some very profound theological things. And I think what the pandemic has done is raised all these things for us. And for us as Christians to witness to the depth of uh, what uh, creation and its suffering is all about and the redemptive dimension that Christ's death and resurrection brings is really profound. And I think we can do a wonderful uh, job of exploring that and witnessing it in our cultures. Thank you, sir. Uh, there was uh, somebody by the name of Galaxy J7. I think it is our friend from Odisha from the Bible College, and he's raised his hands. Uh, I have given them permission to talk. Uh, so if you can ask your question, but then Dr. Chris Sajan has a question. So if they will not ask a question, then, then I would uh, take the question of Dr. Chris Sajan. And there is the Nimai Suna also who wanted to ask a question because they have raised their hands. Yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Fini, thank you for the beautiful presentation. Um, we, I get to talk to you after long years. Uh, first, I met you there in, uh, in the John Stratton Ministry get together uh, in uh, Dehradun area. Well, anyway. Um, your presentation was beautiful, but I have two questions. One is a question of uh, just a category, and the second one is a theological question. Number one, you said that um, suffering to be part of the created order. Uh, just you mean that's a part of, part of the fallen order or the part of the original created order? Uh, second question will be, um, you talked about uh, suffering, and uh, thank you the beautiful way you have presented it. Uh, my question will be, where is the place of divine sovereignty? Uh, it is wonderful. You talked about the theology of suffering, but I think without the theology of uh, divine sovereignty, it is uh, possible to go emotionally, uh, just making God is also another sufferer eternally. But if his God is a divine sovereign, then uh, suffering is, has its own place instead of it becoming part of God's own experience eternally as well. I do not know if I'll go with Dr. Vina all the way as he was talking. 
um, what is the place of divine sovereignty in this uh, COVID-19 world? What is the hope that the church can give to the world today uh, in the light of that divine sovereignty? And how does the divine sovereignty define our theology of suffering? Thank you, uh, Dr. Nimai. Um, glad that we could uh, be here together. Um, the first question, again, um, uh, you know, the reference I made was again in the original order, not after the uh, sin uh, situation. <clears throat> uh, and those elements which have, uh, which already uh, Dr. Vinay has explained uh, regarding that. So that is where uh, the answer to the first one. And the second one, again, divine sovereignty. How do we understand that? Um, sovereignty, is it... The key to New Testament theology is God with us. You know, the manual aspect is very much part uh, of New Testament. And we have not explored God's sovereignty in those levels as he participates in suffering. Um, um, particularly Matthean theology is very much, it begins with Emmanuel, then at the middle of his gospel again comes God is with us, and at the end too, God is with us in a situation of you know, where Mary undergoing the situation, and then when the church was under crisis, there God with us. And then at the end, when he um, gives the final command, he gives, I'm with you always. Um, I think it's a time for us to actually look at how as South Asians interpret God's sovereignty and its theology in a way that is much more relevant to us. Um, maybe others can step in or join in uh, to answer this question. I think very quickly, uh, 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 Philip, uh, uh, Finney, is the, the, uh, in the image I have when we think of sovereignty, uh, the way in which uh, uh, Dr. Nmai is uh, talking about it, I think he is using sovereignty, uh, using it as power, primarily as power. And therefore, how does power relate to suffering? So the image that comes to me is Jesus standing before both Herod and Pilate and saying, you know, they, they say, what kind of a king are you? He's ask, answering the very question that uh, Nehemiah has put in. What kind of a sovereignty have you got? My sovereignty, like he said, my kingdom is not a kingdom of this world. He was basically saying my sovereignty is not a sovereignty as you understand it. It's a very different way of understanding sovereignty. Here was a help, someone who was God himself, standing helpless, allowing himself to be killed, allowing himself to be spat upon, allowing a crown of thorns, uh, uh, something of shame to be put on him, allowing him to be marched. So he's saying, this is my sovereignty. So in a way, <laughs> what we are asking the question is, how does, instead of saying, where is God is sovereignty, what I think I would love to ask is, how is God's sovereignty being displayed in the way we are responding to the COVID uh, pandemic, rather than saying, uh, where are you, you powerful God? Because we are then in the side of Herod and uh, uh, Pilate and telling him, if you are a God, why aren't you showing, all your, showing off your power? He's saying, okay, I'm showing off my power, but it's a very different way of understanding my sovereignty and power in a very different way. And I think that really has been the witness of the church, early church certainly, uh, uh, till, the, uh, till Constantine came in and changed all our understanding and made us believe that we should have sovereignty like the pilots, the Roman emperors of the world. So that is really still the challenge to church today. And the colonial uh, mission was exactly the same thing. Uh, the mission from uh, uh, the greatest country in the world, the superpower of the world, is exactly the same thing today. So whether it's that kind of Christianity of the powerful superpower of the world or a Christianity of the poor of India and the, uh, the suffering churches of the non-Western world is a different way of looking at it. I think that's really something we need to look at. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Samuel. There are a couple of questions, one from Dr. Chris Sudden and the other one from Sunny John. But uh, my, my uh, little uh, contribution to the sovereignty and, and, and a savior who suffers, you know, you can perhaps only understand this uh, uh, by visualizing it as Revelations does in Revelation chapter 5, where it talks about the wounded lamb who's sitting on the throne of everlasting power and authority. Uh, the Redeemer, uh, the suffering Savior, is also the ruler. The, the suffering servant becomes the sovereign, uh, so to say. So uh, we can really reconcile both of these things, but enough about uh, what I think. Uh, let me go to the question that Dr. Chris Sudden had. And uh, he says, uh, in general, does religion offer a framework for understanding and placing suffering, and that gave a basis for patience. In general, does religion offer a framework for understanding and placing suffering, and that gave a basis for patience? Can Christians encourage people to see religion not as an escape, but as a resource for dealing with suffering and pain? And he then says, this is also the theme of Dr. Sukhdev's article. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chris. Uh, um, beautifully put. This exactly I was trying to say. The early church, particularly uh, after the post apostolic period, things were not, you know, I think I've been, I've been going through some of these early churches and being very beautifully seen how uh, church becomes the resource, and that's why the growth has happened. You don't go with great theological statements of uh, redemption. Rather, you go with a, your habitual behavior and theology of patience, which is developed within your gathering of worship. Mm -hmm. um, four elements, which uh, I think uh, Alan Kreider has brought in his book, uh, The Patient Firmament of the Early Church, has beautifully described this. There are four aspects that we need to look at the early church. One is the theology of patience. The other is the habitus, the reflexive, uh, bodily behavior and how did they develop that? That developed in their worship, in their catechism. And the church gathered so that their behavior is shaped. When you break the bread, when you are engaged in baptism, when you are engaged in fellowship, the behavior has developed Christ-likeness. And that led to a fermentation within the society. And people looked at believers, Christians, and they then come to see what is happening with them. I think we should become that resource. We as individuals, as human beings, and we have taken theology into a level in which logic, um, reasoning, you know, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I do uh, look at uh, the Western uh, counterparts in understanding of God as you, they start with rationality and logic, then come to the knowledge of God, and then later to an experiential dimension and in, intimacy with God. But looking from a South Asian point of view, we begin with experience. We begin with how we live in the community, and from there a knowledge of God comes, and from where the logical sequences begin. So, um, you know, agreeing very much with uh, Dr. Sadhguru um, regarding your question as we become the resource for people to come. You may have to There are two questions. Sir. Yeah, sorry. There are two questions. Uh, I'll club them both together even though they don't belong together uh, because we are running out of time. And after these two questions, we'll take just one more question, uh, which I already have. So please don't send any more new questions. So, Sunny uh, John uh, th says, how do you respond to the argument pestilence as a punishment from the Lord for the wickedness of humanity? Genesis 6, 5. I believe Dr. Vinay dealt with it in his presentation in the first webinar, but uh, uh, this perfect time to deal with it even now. So, how do you respond to the argument pestilence uh, as a punishment from the Lord for the wickedness of humanity? And then uh, uh, Ravi Dongarwar says, if we expect for blessings, gifts and treasures and all things from the Lord. But why are we not ready to pay the price in suffering? Why is that? So uh, these two questions and then a question from uh, uh, Brother Kulothangan and then we can end. 
Dr. Finney. Excellent. If you just look at just the word formation or the use of the vocabulary, um, you know, there are a lot of verses that supports your thought. But at the same time, we need to see scripture from the larger uh, point of view where where the same thing has happened uh, as a natural cause, then how do you explain that? Um, definitely God, sin and the disobedience bring pestilence or disaster, but at the same time, there are passages in the scripture which also talks about naturally, it, uh, it comes as a natural form. Um, that, that understanding we need to bring, we need to bring that balancing. We cannot just take everything in terms of judgment. That's why I said there is a hierarchy of um, doctrinal hierarchy that controls our attitudes and behavior. So it's time for us to look at scripture as a whole and see how God has dealt with his people. Uh, when there is need for punishment and correction, when there is a teaching element is involved, God involves with that. And also, thank you, Kolatungan, uh, for that question. Um, yes, we receive good things from God at the same time, suffering uh, should be part of our life too. I think, you know, we, I think uh, that's a, it's rather a statement than a question for me. That was uh, Ravi Dogarwar, not uh, Brother Kolatungan. Awesome. Brother Kulutangan has offered a comment and a request and a, then a question. So he says, thank you for your very sound and scholarly presentation. Is it possible to, for me to have your paper to read it again, to understand and able to teach others in my circle of covering? And he's given his email address. Uh, Brother Kulo, we'll be sending the paper to all the participants. That is why we've wanted everybody to register so that we have their email IDs so that we can send the paper to them. It will also be uploaded on EFI website. Uh, so for all the participants, it will be updated on our website and you can also find it on our Facebook page. And then he says the question, he says, how can we explain God's purposive will and permissive will to the ones who have lost their li the lives of their loved ones due to no mistake of theirs due to COVID-19? How do you explain that? Well, that's a very difficult question. <laughs> uh... Yeah. Yeah, Vijay, do you have any thoughts? I think I think I can step in here. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Finney, you had you have beautifully done an excellent presentation about the theology of presence and the theology of patience, and I think evil and suffering has been a part of our you know, discourse back to the times of Buddha, uh, where evil, suffering, the cause of evil, the cause of suffering and things like that, the noble paths and all those things. And uh, I think, uh, you know, we, 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 we have uh, discussed about the theology of patience and how we need to endure. But I also would like to add about the theology of hope that Dr. Jorgen Moltmann talks about. So patience is always a part, you know, connected with the the aspect of hope, whether it's eschatological hope or whether, and I think Dr. Moltmann uh, does not talk about a hope which is eschatological for him. The theology of hope is from the beginning, from the garden itself, uh, from the time of creation itself. So hope is very internally linked with the entire creation narrative as well till the end of the ages. So I think the theology of hope in, in a part of it will be dealt in the next seminar, near next webinar rather, the death and bereavement part, where we will be discussing about hope and what we as Christians have and what we can share with the communities around us. So this particular question that was just raised by Dr. Uh, by, by Kulothungan, by Mr. Kulothungan, uh, yep. is basically, yep. Reverend Kulothungan, uh, uh, is basically quite connected to the last webinar where we will be discussing about death and bereavement. So I think it comes as a good, uh, you know, a leap into the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abhishek. Uh, would you like to make announcement for the next webinar before I thank Dr. Finney? Yes. So we meet again next week uh, on Thursday. Dr. Leela Manasseh will be speaking about death and bereavement. 
uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, and we will meet at the same time at 4 p.m. That will be the last webinar of the series, and the, all the uh, video recordings, the um, you know the, the notes and everything, we are continually uploading in the EFI page. So I would request everybody, every participant, to please make use of those resources. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I wanted to thank you, Dr. Finney, uh, on behalf of EFI and the EFI Theological Commission. Thank you for your presentation. Insightful, stimulating, and uh, you know, just very apt, very apt. Thank you so much for taking the time. And we await the paper. As soon as we have the paper, we'll send it to all the registered participants, even the ones who couldn't make it. So thank you so much. And, uh, uh, do stay on, you know, EFI Theological Commission. We are planning another series of webinars soon. Abhishek uh, is working uh, on that with uh, Dr. Bill. I think Reverend Vijesh is offline. Looks like that. Yes. So uh, like he was talking, um, I'm working on the next series of webinars, which will hopefully begin in the month of October and continue till November. Um, this will be another exciting thing that we are coming up with. So I think that is it. Um, yeah, Reverend Lal is back. Over here, can you hear me? Yes, yes. And I okay. completed your sentence about the uh, uh, next series of webinars. Yes. And so I'd like to request uh, Dr. Laji Paul now uh, to close us with a word of prayer and benediction. Brother Laji? Yeah. Are you there? Yes, very much. And if we can see your face, that would be even more better. I right, thank you. But I think there is some challenge for my video, not able to. Okay. Uh, but uh, sorry okay. for that. But let's look to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for this awesome time of uh, uh, looking at your scriptures and trying to understand uh, in a holistic way about this pandemic and how we need to respond as godly people. And Lord, we thank you for EFI Theological Commission webinar for um, all these wonderful uh, inputs that we got from Dr. Finney, Dr. Vinay, and uh, their uh, absolutely amazing insights and how we need to look at uh, uh, the whole thing in a very comprehensive way so that we meaningfully respond uh, in this crisis. And we are not just one-sided, we are not lopsided or Lord, that we truly represent you, uh, we honor your name even in this process, and we bring glory to you and we accomplish your plans for us even in this season, even as you have placed us in this season, Lord. Uh, we ask your grace upon Dr. Finney and Dr. Vinay and continue to sharpen them and their skills and continue to make them a blessing for many, many people. Thank you for uh, Reverend Vijesh, Lord, and for EFI and Reverend Abhishek and all the team that has put in this hard work and uh, uh, for this process of learning interaction that you have granted us. We are so grateful. Can you bless them? Even the upcoming webinars will be a great blessing for the body of Christ, that Lord, we will be enriched and we will be, Lord, able to do all that you are calling us to do and honor you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, wish to express my thanks to Dr. Finney Philip and to Dr. Vinay Samuel. Thank you, Dr. Laji Paul as well. And thank you, Abhishek, for uh, putting everything together. Uh, we meet again next Thursday for a theology of death and bereavement. And the speaker is uh, Mrs. Um, sorry, Ms. Leela Manasse. So thank you so much. Thank from you. EFI, take care. God bless you all. Bye-bye.